we talk about home not just, home is not defined by our address or where we reside, but home is defined by our values. We've been saying that for a few weeks now, that home, remember, it's a, it's a spiritual word. It's a word that when you say it, it invokes emotions and spiritual connotations in others and, and it remotes memories and we think about different areas of our life. Home is, home is more than just an address, right? I have lived in several homes in my life, but home is where my family resides. Home is where my values are present. Home is where things are, where I feel like I'm at my best, right? And this is where home is. So um, today we're gonna carry our home series into what I call home remedies. All right, now everybody has them, right? We all have different things. A few years ago, a while ago, there was a movie called The, the Big Fat Greek Wedding, and I loved it because it was one of those times where, where you learn, you get a picture into people's homes, and the best one was that, that Windex cures everything. The dad would run around with a Windex bottle, and it didn't matter if you broke your arm or needed to lube up your car, it was Windex, right? It didn't matter. He just sprayed Windex on it, rubbed a little Windex on it. That was the, the family cure for all things was Windex. Index, right? We all have some of those in our families. That's why we like it so much, right? I remember one that I learned as I was growing older. I didn't, I didn't understand it, but when you burn yourself in some cultures or in some places, what they do is they put mustard on it. I don't know why they put mustard on it, but, I, but, they, but I've seen it done over and over again. They put mustard on it. Now, I'm going to tell you, it works. If you've ever burnt yourself really bad, I'm going to recommend you try a little French's on there. You know what I mean? Get it done. But but it is, it's a home remedy. It's one that we don't talk about. The doctors are not prescribing mustard, but, there are, but it is one of those home remedies that people believe in so strongly, and it does work. Now, I think we all have a little bit of that in each of our homes. We all have different things that we do, and sometimes we don't even know they're weird until we go to college or we get married, right? We thought we were normal. We thought what we did in our house for 30 years was normal, and then suddenly we're like, oh, your family doesn't do that? Oh. We've always used mustard, you know what I mean? It was, it's just one of those things. So um, I had a family, a guy one time, he was talking about what his mom did, and I thought it was really neat. And he would tell the story of, he was, they were not big into discipline as far as like negative discipline or all that. He said, you really just didn't want to disappoint his mom. And so she would gather them around and she would sit them down. And whenever they did something that was not what she was looking for, she would gather them in and she would sit them down and she would say, hey, Lawlers don't do that, you know? So we would say in our family, hey, Duffies, don't do that. You know what I mean? This is just something that we're gonna talk about. Hey, that's not how we act. And you don't have to make it like a global thing. You don't have to have any backing from the UN or from anybody, you know, just that's not how our house is gonna operate, right? We have home remedies. And so when he said that, it just kind of resonated in my heart. And we've kind of done that a little bit with our kids. We're like, that's not what Duffies do, you know? We, we, maybe others do it, but that's not what Duffy's do, and you, you get to be a Duffy, so that's how it works. So I think about some of the home remedies as simple as just, you know, call that attention to the home, call the attention to the values, and we, we kind of want to do that. So some are funny, some are pretty normal, um, but it may seem weird or different, but this is how we act. And if we're going to have be a cr- positive Christian force in our community, in our world, then we have to have some things that we do, right? This is not what Christians do. This is not how Christians act. This is how we handle that. We handle that with prayer. We anoint that with oil. You know, we speak over that in the name of Jesus. We do these things, right? And some of them seem very Christianese terms, and maybe they're, they're new to you or new to your friends, but they can still be our values that we express and learn and do, okay? And I'm not talking about legalism, you know, right? We, I grew up in legalism where people had to wear long sleeves or, you know, long pants or girls could only wear dresses or you can't cut your hair. I'm not talking about any of those things, you know? I know, you guys, I'm just telling you what I grew up in. But look, this is, you know, these things are existing, but those are, those are things that they, they put a value that you can't be Christian if you don't do this. And you can't be, I'm not talking about it that way. I'm talking about it as a positive force in our community that these are things that, hey, this is what we represent, and that's what we've kind of been talking about all these weeks, right? But the Apostle Paul gives us some definite guidance. So before you listen to someone who makes up rules that are outside of the Bible, we should probably listen to the ones that are inside the Bible, right? So we're going to go to Ephesians. We're going to begin at uh, chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 17 and read through 23. If you guys will follow along with me, it says this. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of 
of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as, not, as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learn. When you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off the old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to make to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on your new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. He said, when you became Christians, when you took on this walk of, of living for Christ, the way of Christ, the old man passed away, right? The old way of doing things stopped and, the, and there's a new way of doing things that we have to do. He says, look, since we are saved and have had an experience in Christ, our behavior should change. We should not look the same on this day as we do the day after that. Now, I'm not saying it's some magical wand and you're perfect, you know, moving forward. I'm just saying that we should look different and strive to look differently. Paul describes that they've lost all sensitivity and their hearts are hardened. And, and I think, man, that was thousands of years ago and he's describing our today, right? That the people we're surrounded with a lot of times have no sensitivity and their hearts are hardened and they, they don't see what is good. Sometimes they're just all about themselves. And Paul's saying, that's not the way we are to be as Christians. That's the way you were before. That's what you were taught before. Look out for number one was your battle cry before. That used to be your family motto. Now it's love God, love each other, reach out. There's a difference between those two actions. Right, And as we, as we move forward in that, we have to say that there has to be evidence of a life change. Evidence of a life change is when people ask me if I believe someone's a Christian or, or I think that they had a true experience. That's a weird question, right? People ask you that. People are like, well, they, I saw you baptize them. Do you believe they're different than they were the next day? You know what I mean? And, and so I look at it this way, right? I always look for the evidence of life change. Do you know why I look for evidence of life change? Because I've seen God do it so much. I've seen people who were who were bound and caught in drug addictions, and I've seen them turn around and live for God and preach from pulpits, right? You know what I mean? I have seen a life change in people, and if you have an encounter with the Almighty God, you should not come out of it the same way, right? You should be different. We had a girl who was in our ministry, and um, she used, I think she just used to come to church to try and offend people. You know what I mean? She, what, she, what she wore, the way she dressed, she would dress not for her body type and in the weirdest things. I'm, I'm going to tell you, honestly, one day she wore a shirt about smoking pot just to see what people would say, right? Because she wanted people to reject her from the church. After she, after she was saved and was making a different commitment, she still came to church one day. I, I kid you not, it was in a blue taffeta dress that was too small for her. And I was like, why are you wearing that? Is that, is that the only dress you have? I mean, I didn't talk to her, but I was like, she just wanted a reaction Right? She was looking for a reaction because this is her old life and she was walking in there. No one gave her one, which is so amazing. But the truth is, is that as she, she moved forward in Christ, and this was and not just in the way she dresses. Can I tell you? She had some serious issues. She was living in a different home than her husband. Her kids were being taken care of by her parents and other various friends. She was living, she was sleeping on couches. She was into drugs and alcohol. She had had a serious hurt in her life that was guiding all of her decisions. And to see her five years later, to see her bright-faced and, and able-bodied and loving Jesus, not she hasn't figured it all out yet, but she's so far away from the person that she was to where it is now. And you could run up against her today and try to put her on some Christian scale and see if she matched it all, and she's going to fail. But I saw her then, right? I saw her pre-Jesus, and I've seen her post-Jesus. Right? We're not asking for perfection. We're not, I don't even, I'm not your judge. I'm just saying that when I look out, I see a difference in those who've had an encounter with Jesus Christ. And this is what Paul's saying. He's not putting a list of laws that we have to do. He's saying, you're going to want to do different things once you've had an encounter with Christ. Your attitude, your demeanor, your actions, things are going to change because you found a place that has joy and hope and you're going to want to reach toward it in an incredible way. And, you may, and you're going to break it all up. You're going to mess it up. I messed it up, right? We're all going to mess it up. But you know what? As long as we keep striving, we're going to get there, right? If we continue to draw closer to God, he's going to continue to draw closer 
to them. People who've lived 25 plus years of her life and then the five years of a difference, right? And you know it when it happens to you and you know it when you see it. And so that's what I look for in people. Now, I, I, I want to challenge you because like a lot of people when we make the lists of like our, we had this in Chi Alpha, right? We had a list of things that were, these were what we're made up of, you know? And I, and I don't want this to get there because one of their things was excellence, right? And uh, we went to the University of Virginia to be with Pete Bulette and his team, and he had all of the values up on their walls, and he had actually changed one. And he said, look, we had a big deal. We took down excellence. And I was like, you took down excellence? I mean, because want, everybody wants to be excellent, right? We're all trying to get there. It's part of every company you work for. It's a lot of mission statements, right? Excellence, right? And he says, the problem with excellence is that it's not measurable. That the minute that you achieve it, there's another level of excellence. Right? And he said, he says, and I wanted people to have something they could win to. So he says, so we took it down and we changed it to improvement. <laughs> right? That you got to be different than you were before. You have to be one step further than you were the next. And I like that attitude, right? When we're looking for God to do things in lives, people don't go from zero to 100, right? They go from 0 to 10, right? You know what I mean? And then they go to 11. You know what I'm talking about? Maybe they jump to 15, but 20 is like, that's monumentous, you know? You know what I'm saying? So it, we, we need to be celebrating improvements, celebrating people's walk with Christ and doing that. Because repent, repent just simply means to do an about face. It just simply means to turn around. I know we think it means we have to cry and snot on an altar and tell God we for, you know, we're so sorry for everything. But really, it just means to turn around. It's re- just turn around because God's already there. He's right there with you. Right? Look, Christianity can look differently based on who you talk to, right? If you had to, if you went up to 10 different people and told them, asked them what it meant to be Christian, you'd probably get 10 different lists, right? So I, I, that's why I'm kind of sticking to what Paul's saying here, and we're going to go a little bit further into what God says it means to be a godly person, to be before there was the word Christian, what it meant to follow God, right? So Paul goes on and tells a little bit. We'll read the 25 through 28 before we get to the next part, but it says, Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Paul says, Let, let's, take, let's put this down in some basics real quick, right? First thing he says, stop gossiping and spreading lies. Amen. Do you know why you have to stop gossiping and spreading lies? Because it, got, it blows in the face of loving everyone. How can you possibly love everyone? How can you love one another and love God if you're gossiping and telling lies about other people? He says that definitely is an action that we can, we can earmark as not what we're looking for, right? This is, this is a life change that God's like. He goes, and then he says, when you're angry, don't sin, right? Now that, I don't know, anybody have trouble with that one? Just me, I'm the only one? Okay, when, when you're angry, don't sin. No, I love this one. Don't go to bed angry. Yeah, okay. You want me to stay awake mad? Which you got? <laughs> Put a little scale out there, see which one you want, right? You know? But he says this, he says, don't do those things. He says, the really, you know, you're going to be angry. You're, you're, going to, you're going to have anger. He tries to give you a little more guidance on it. But the truth is, is that you don't want to harbor that anger because it gives the devil a, an earmark and a foothold to come at you with. Because then every time you hear that name, every time you go after that, every time that person shows up in a room, right? Every time, then that's a trigger for the enemy to begin to, in your head, all the time. Right? He says, so be careful about that. Don't harbor anger. Stop stealing. I love that. He says, stop stealing. Right? Like we're all stealers. Stop stealing. You know, put that paper clip back. Right? You know, <laughs> stop stealing. And he says, but do good with it. Right? So he talks about the Ten Commandments. Right? This is, so I, I kind of liken this to the Ten Commandments a little bit. Right? Now, the, my, uh, we're teaching the Ten Commandments next door while well, they're doing uh, Moses and getting the Ten Commandments next door in kids' church. So maybe this will go along with that. Right? With it. But... But I think it's important to understand that when God wrote the Ten Commandments, how many of you know that God is perfect? Right? Just don't, God is perfect. So if he had to make, if you ask God, what does it mean to follow you? 
Like, you're going to be my people, and my people are going to know you from here on out. How many of you know that if God made a list of ten things, that it was probably the most important ten? Right? That if, God, if you told God, God, you can only write me one sentence of what it means to be a Christian, how many of you know it would be the most perfect list, right? The perfect sentence. And I think that, that's great to think about, but sometimes we're, we're all into Law 613, Right? Or we're trying to read Paul's writings and decipher what he's trying to say, but we haven't even got the 10 down. I'm saying let's go back to some elementary level. I love we did a, we did a, a, a vacation Bible school one time. And my aunt came down and taught us the Ten Commandments. Right? This is how she taught them, so you can, you can take this with a grain of salt or whatever you want. I'm just going to tell you how I remember the Ten Commandments. Right? One, there's one God. Right? That's it. Two, Two, we're going to cut out idols. See how we do that, right? Cut out idols, right? Three, watch your words, right? We're going to watch what we're saying and what we're doing. This one's a little, uh, little hokey, but it just gets there. There's four, right? Mother, father, son, daughter, four people going to church, right? Remember the Sabbath. This is what we're doing in a car, going to church, right? Five, hi, mom and dad. Okay, we're going to honor our father and mother, right? Six, don't shoot your parents. Okay, don't kill. Don't kill, okay? Seven, V is for virginity, so let's be pure, right? We're going to do that, okay? Eight, he says, he says when, you, when you steal in the old cultures, they cut off your thumb and your, and your forefinger so you couldn't grab anything, so don't steal, okay? Eight, you know? All right, nine, there's, there's, there's uh, um, nine is nine going one way, one going the wrong way. Don't lie. You're the liar. You know, there's truth, right? You know? And then ten is don't covet, okay? Right? So those are the Ten Commandments, right? I could read them to you out of Exodus 20, but I'm just telling you that those are the Ten Commandments. And if you you can remember those, then it's an elementary, basic learning of what it means to walk out a life with God. And Paul, so like, I love that he talks about gossiping and lying. He talks about wronging your brother, stealing. He talks about doing those things. Just in these few scriptures, Paul is like, hey, it's really simple. Let's go back to the original way we learn. Right? Let's go back to what God says important, is that there's the Ten Commandments. So remember, hey, gossiping makes you less trustworthy. Can I be honest with you? That when people hear you talk about other people, their first thought is, what are they saying about me when I'm not here? It makes you not want to share information with another person. How many of you have had that conversation with someone that you told in secret, and sometime in the near future, someone else came back and told your words back to you? That person is no longer the person I share with, right? But we've all had it. And it's, it's kind of natural because we want to share our day. We want to share our things. But we can't, we can't do that, right? We have to be, if we're going to be true and honest, then we have to be true and honest in our actions all the way around. Remember, others are watching you, right? If you're gossiping and lying about other people, people are taking note. Some, your kids are taking note on how to act, right? We're, we're, we're showing other people how to treat us and how to act. Anger leads to nowhere good. Nowhere, nowhere does, I've never been angry and it led me to the place of my fulfillment, right? Anger does not lead to good places, right? Especially unresolved anger. It always leads to blow up. We're proponents, you know, Stephanie and I, we, we counsel people in marriages sometimes and we tell them, hey, I would rather you have the fight, say whatever you need to say and walk away and everybody process it than I would you to hold it in and be bitter and bitter and bitter because when you do say it, it's done, man. You're gonna say things and believe things and do things that you don't know. There's no sense in having unresolved anger. Have the fight. Can I, can I encourage you as your pastor? Have the fight. It's, you have the fight when you're, when, you're, when you're stuck in that issue. It's so much better than it is holding it on and 20 years later going like, remember that one time, 1985, <laughs> right? Have the fight. Have the conversation. It's better to do that and to be up front because if you're holding that anger in, the only person you're injuring is yourself, right? And later you'll injure others because you, you have this negative attitude about yourself moving, on, moving forward. All right, um, um, don't steal. I love that he doesn't say just don't steal, right? That's what the, the Ten Commandments say, don't steal. But the truth is, is that the reason he doesn't want you stealing is because it's actually a mentality, right? If you think what others have is mine, right, then you don't have the right frame of mind. If you're in a place where you need it so bad that you're stealing, then you need to change some things about your life to try and get over that hump to the other side. He says, look, Don't just not steal. 
get yourself into a place, get your family into a place where you're the giver, not the stealer. Right? I love that about that. You don't want to be the taker. You want to be the generous person that exists. And, and Paul says, don't just stop stealing. Move your life toward a place where you can give generos- generously to those in need. Where instead of being the taker, you're the provider. I'm like, wow, what an incredible concept that he just doesn't leave it to stop stealing, but he says, stealing is a byproduct. Nobody wants to harm another person by stealing, mostly. They do it out of need for the most part. So our families and our church and our life, the better we get at understanding how you know, finances or how resources work, then we become a more generous person on the outside. And he says, God's way works. Find a way to use God's way to do it, right? If God will teach you how to generosity, that's why generosity is in there. It's not because the church is so desperate that they need stuff. It's because it teaches you something that's different than where you were, right? It's an evidence of a life change. You're no longer the receiver. Now you're the giver, right? Evidence of a life change, right? So if you can get, take your finances to being, instead of being so shallow that you have to steal to being so much where you get to be a blessing to others. God, how do we do that? How do we do that? Can I honestly tell you, we talk about finances, so I'm not just a side note, it's not in my notes. But I remember one time, I, and, and I said, I, I was in a prayer one time, and we just were, we were getting our finances together because we used to be horrible, right? And we were getting things together and moving on. And I remember I got to the point in God where we had been faithful, we're doing, God's changing our life, I can see it. And, and I was like, I, I, one day I was just praying because I was like, God, can I please not have to look at my bank account to go to the store to buy toilet paper? Like, can I just see a need in my house, toothpaste, toilet paper, and not wonder, do I need to make it to Friday? How do I put only a little bit of toothpaste on my toothbrush, God? Can I just, God, I don't want to live in a scarcity mindset anymore. I want to live in an abundance mindset. Will you help me, God? Will you help me to do that? Can I tell you God helped me to do that? because I prayed it. Sometimes we just got to get to that point where we say, God, I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. This is not the life. I, you've changed my life in so many ways, but I need a life change here. Can you help me out? And let God do it. He's that kind of God. So look, I, just, I don't want to keep harping on it, but you, hey, you and I are not just protecting our reputation when we do these things, when we, when we change our attitudes to do the right things. We're protecting the reputation of the church, of God, the community of the kingdom of God, right? As we grow, the community grows. And, we get, and others get to see life change in us and they get to move that. Now, certain actions that we do don't show our love one to another, right? Paul goes into this a little bit as it starts in verse 49 and it says this. Don't let any un- unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. He says, act in conjunction with the Spirit, not against it. Start doing things that are fruits of the Spirit, right? Not works of the flesh. In Galatians 5.22, you can go there, right? But start doing things that look like God, not that look like us. I know for me, I, I have this, my, my personal rule is that if I have an interaction with you, I want you to leave knowing some things about me, right? This is my, this is, I want you to leave with a mark. I want you to know that, hey, I'm for you, right? I'm for you, I love you, and that I want nothing but the best for you. If I have an interaction with you, then that's my goal of leaving the conversation. And you have to have a goal at the end of the conversation, because if not, you just have the conversation. And sometimes you have to be correcting, and sometimes you have to be loving, and sometimes you have to, even in my own household, right? But I want everyone to leave knowing those three things about me. If, you leave, if, we, have, if we leave a conversation and you don't know that I love you, I'm for you, and that whatever you need, I want, I want the best for you, then we're not having the right conversation. Because if not, I may leave you in some of these stages, in my, in my bitterness, in my rage, in my anger, Right? We may talk about other people. We may be dealing in slander, but we have to do that. Freedom is a tricky thing, right? We have the freedom to do all, but not everything is prudent, right? We have to, 
we have to know and be intentional about leaving the right mark when we leave a situation. We have to leave a godly mark. We have to say God is what we're trying to get to. We're going to hang on to his principles, not my principles, right? We're going to hang on to his principles. David Green, who's the head of Hobby Lobby, uh, Hobby Lobby is a, a big retail chain store and they're a godly company. He's built it on godly foundations. He didn't start it all that way. He actually closed down on Sundays about midway through the time they've existed. And, and God has blessed them. He's written, written a few books telling about what he did. And one is called Giving It All Away, which these are great books. But some of you may know Hobby Lobby because they actually had a crisis on their hand when the Affordable Care Act got passed in the, in the House and in Congress and the president signed it, then it was the law of the land. But the Affordable Care Act said that com companies could not prevent their health care plans from offering things like the overnight pill, the abortion pill, or even funding some abortions or, or Planned Parenthood, and that that's where some of their funds could go. And Hobby Lobby, who's a, a large provider for their employees, said, hey, we, we don't want to do that. It's against our principles. It's, it, you know, don't kill. Remember, don't kill your parents. You know what I mean? It's in the it's in the top 10, right? And this is something that we, we can't do. So they were, they were set at a moment where they didn't know what they were gonna do. And he, he describes it in both of his books as I've read them and he, and he tells about the situation that they actually came down and they knew at that moment, their, their first thought was, well, we can just, I guess we're just gonna have to close all of the doors. We're gonna have to no longer be a company because we can't, the federal law, we, we've stood for our, our values in certain things against cities and municipalities and against our own kind. We've stood in that one, but we've never been against the federal government before and they're mandating what we can do. He says, so our first reaction was we can shut down. He goes, but we did, we were presented another option. He says, we got some lawyers together and that was that we could fight it. We could go to court. He says, but that court leads to the next court, to the next court, because we're dealing with changing a law of the land. He said, it has to go all the way to the Supreme Court. Now, I don't know what you know about lawyers, but they're not cheap. And that requires a lot of time and energy. Matter of fact, it took multiple years, right, for their case to go up the, up the thing. They fought it. They did not offer it, and they fought it in court, paid fine after fine, day after day, right? But what they did first is they knew that it was violating their values. And they got everybody in their family together. They called a family meeting into their house. And he said, and we sat down, and I told them that, I, that, that, you know what, guys, I think by our values, we can't go this way, so we're going to have to shut the company down, or this is the other option we have, but it may drain us, and we may shut the company down anyway. And he says the family got together, they ate, they talked. He says, and at the end, they all stood up one by one and say, let's go to the Supreme Court. Let's take it. Let's stand up for our values, let's fight this, and let's just go as far as it'll go. If we're going to lose the company, we're going to lose it fighting. We're not going to lose it just because we decided to not fight. And I thought, man, that, that is a great example of what I'm trying to get out of this sermon to you guys today, right? This is the moment where I want you to say, as a family, as a church, of, as a family of believers, as a church, as your internal households, as your family, we've got to set some guidelines that we're not going to cross. That we're not going to break the Ten Commandments. That should be an easy one, right? That we, we are going to stand and we're going to decide that God is greater than these other things in our life. Now, they went to the Supreme Court and they won. And they won on a civil liberties issue, right? It's the freedom of religion, you know, the First Amendment, right? It, it, that's what they won on. And, and can I tell you, a lot of times we talk about, especially with, when we're talking about COVID and the different mandates, we, we talk about civil liberties probably too much now, right? You know? But can I tell you, they did not take it to the court because of the civil liberties issue. They were not fighting for the Constitution. They may benefit the Constitution, but they weren't fighting for the Constitution. They were fighting for the Almighty. That's where our allegiance lies with Jesus Christ, with the Ten Commandments. When you're setting your things to move forward and fight on, we have to say, we're going to stand on the Word of God. This is what we're going to stand on in our actions and what we're doing. You guys can go ahead and come up. Let me skip down a little bit. I'm sorry. Look, when we establish Christ in our homes, others will be drawn to God. When we establish Christ in our homes, God, people will see a difference in what we're doing versus what they're doing, and others will come. 
Look, God says he loves it when we give of ourselves to another being. It's part of who he is. When we give that, he loves that. So this week, I would like for you guys, this is my challenge to you for the week. This week, I would like you to gather your home together. Have a David Green family meeting. And in that family meeting, say, hey, this is who the Duffies are. Amen? Amen. This is who the Lawlers are. This is who the Garcias are. This is who the Roques are. This is who our family is. And this is what we're going to stand for when we leave here. And it's not going to be based on what we feel is right, what we like is right. It's going to be based on the Word of God. And when you do that, your family will be stronger. And when we do that as a church, and we have this series like the Home Series, and we talk about what it means to be home, we become stronger as a family. And God will bring others to us. He will draw them to us if we can just know who we are, right? Paul wants us to be sure of who we are in Ephesians. You're a child of God. Act like it. He's changed your life. Be like it. Don't go back to your old ways just because it feels right. Stand on the principles of God and move forward from there. So today I want to pray for a few groups. We're going to go to communion in just a few moments after I say this prayer, but... If you don't have a cup, then raise your hand. If you're at home watching, then, you know, find your coffee and a cracker. Do what you need to do um, so that you can do this with us. We're not, we're not legalistic about it, but we definitely want to take part of the communion. But before we do that, I want to pray for those out of the end of this. There are some here today who are new to Christ and are struggling with life change. It's hard. You keep finding yourself slipping back to where you were before. And you don't want to be that anymore. I want to to pray with you today and I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you that God will continue to gently turn you around and that he'll surround you with others who who will encourage you and strengthen you in those moments because it's easy to go back to who we were. We were really good at it, right? But it's not who God has called us to be. So I want to pray for those groups. I also want to pray for those who are challenged to have a family value meeting this week who feel like, hey, this is something we should do. It's overdue. This is something we should do. I want to pray that God will just make way for your meeting, that he'll make your conversation right, that he'll give you the right things to cover and the right values to speak about. And then I want to pray for those who heard today about life change for the first time. Maybe you're here today and you didn't know that there was a difference between what you were yesterday and what you'll be after you choose God. Maybe you didn't know that. Today I want to pray for salvation for you. I want to pray a prayer and you guys can follow along and just say the ugly words I'm going to say and let God begin to do the work in your heart. So let's pray for these three groups as we transition to communion. Heavenly Father, Lord, I love you. And I thank you, God. I thank you for your word today. I thank you that you have just... uh, told us today that we can be different. Lord, I didn't even know we could be different at times. Lord, today I pray for those who are struggling with that life change that you've done in their life. Lord, they feel like they're taking two steps forward and one step back. Some days they're taking one step forward and three steps back, God. And I pray today that you would just shower them with your love, that you would send people around to encourage them and strengthen them, Lord, and that you would put them in the right friend group and in the right people group and that they would begin to turns ever so slowly or ever so quickly, Lord, into your love. Lord, and I want to pray for those who this week are going to have a family values meeting based on what we've done here today, Lord. I pray that you would give them the agenda, you would give them the right mindset, you would give them the words to say, you would let the people be receptive to what they're having in their family, Lord. And as we as I, we have our family values expressed here in this church, God, that you would find open ears and open hearts and open minds to it. Lord, and lastly, I want to pray for those who didn't even know life change was possible. Lord, that they just thought if they just said Jesus was their Savior, that everything would be the same as it was yesterday, so that what's the point? Lord, I pray today that their eyes have been opened and they've seen a life change in those around them and through them, God, that they know that if they choose you today as their Savior, that their life will be different tomorrow. Lord, and today I want to pray with them. Lord, I want to pray... That you are, that Lord, today we ask you into our heart. That you are the Lord of our life, Lord. Lord, that we ask you that you would come into our life and begin to change us from the inside out. Lord, Lord, we believe that you died and were buried 
and you were resurrected and you're coming again, Lord, and that you can do powerful things even to this day, Lord. Lord, we give you our lives and we ask you to be our Savior. It's in your name we pray. Amen and amen.